We're gonna have on in a few minutes one of the greatest rock and rollers ever. Me and Billy Marcia, who was the, the first drummer in the New York Dolls, we started making clothes, you know, to survive and to make a living. And we were all going to the same high school. And uh, one day, I'm in the, uh, in the lunchroom, and I keep on seeing this guy. He's always surrounded by girls, man. He was like a fish magnet, this cat, you know? And I'm going, who the hell this guy is? And I, I find out his name is uh, Giovanni Ginzali which was way too, you know, too colorful for me to actually call him that. And I said, man, we should get this guy in our band, you know, because maybe then we can have chicks too, you know? <laughs> so I asked him, I said, hey man, you wanna, you wanna play with me and Billy, man? We got a band and stuff and all of a sudden he said, nah, I don't know how to play. I don't wanna play, you know? No. A couple weeks later or maybe even a week later, I see him again at the lunchroom. This time he comes up to me and he says, hey Sylvain, how many strings does a guitar have? I said, six. He goes, me. Mm. He says, Sylvain, how many strings does a bass guitar have? I said, four. He said, Sylvain, I'm your fucking bass player. <laughs> and that was it, that's how we started. When we first started playing together, I would go to England and shop for all those cool shoes and those platform boots that they had. The Kensington Market was a really cool place. And of course, the King's Road, you know, glitter and all that stuff was really big. Mark Bowen, my favorite. I don't care what you're gonna call him. But to me, being on stage or being a performer, I have the mentality of putting on a show like, like the Little Rascals. It's like, man, we're bored. What are we gonna do? Well, let's put on our show. Well, where where are we gonna get the curtain? You know, for the for the stage. Oh, my mother's bed sheet. Okay, good. How about the makeup? Okay. In our case, it was we go to our girlfriend's bags. They got more makeup than Bloomingdale's. It wasn't like trying to be androgynous, but yet we were. I mean, you know. Uh, for years, it was the girls' clothes fit me better than the guys' clothes, you know? <laughs> I don't know why. So that's how we started, like, putting things together. It's like, okay, we got to make our own stuff. And we're grabbing our girlfriend's clothes and putting it on and uh, their makeup and, you know, let's put on a show. It was just like a, a visual uh, circus with, you know, attitude and hair and makeup and heels and feathers and but people were afraid of that you know and so i think they played on it because people were afraid of it, it kind of got helped them get in the news and at the time david bowie and some of the other english acts they asked them if they were uh, you know homosexual and they said they were bisexual so they asked david johansson if he was bisexual he said no we're trisexual we'll try anything First time I saw the dolls, I kind of like, was kind of, oh my God, they're beating me to the punch. They beat me to the punch doing what they were doing, you know. The dolls weren't really transgender. They were all straight guys, really, just putting on some women's clothes and wearing lipstick and makeup. But uh, none of them were gay. A lot of people thought the dolls were doing it just to get attention, but it was the thing to do at the time. It was more like blurring the sexes together, really. It was a very androgynous scene, you know, and uh, then you had David Boy happening, which was very uh, androgynous scene. It was kind of a, a mixture of male and female kind of thrown together. The gay liberation people were very upset with the dolls. They were calling them transvestites. Back in the days where people called it female impersonation, you had to call it that or you'd be arrested. Bill, uh, we knew, so me and, Sil me, Sil and Billy used to be in a band. 
I was the bass player and they kicked me out. <laughs> so I hated those guys, I hated them. <laughs> Arthur Kane, we met him also at Nobody's. And then he came there with this big tall guy. Mostly we'd go over to Johnny's apartment, wherever he was living at the time. And he'd show us the songs that he'd come up with on acoustic guitars. Billy and Arthur met this other Colombian guy. His name was uh, Rodrigo Solomon. He said, man, you guys need a lead singer. And there's a guy in my building that man he plays a harmonica he's got long blonde hair and he's a really cool guy man you know and that's david johansson they do their first gig at the close of christmas 1971 after david johansson joins the band i would fly to england i went there for the summer to come back to new york and now they're all playing together with david you know and they're calling themselves the dolls not the new york dolls but the dolls he had just got back from England, and when he found out that Johnny and Billy had a band together, well, naturally he wanted in. Rick Rivers got uh, too lazy, so we got him still. And you have basically the New York Dolls. I said, let's set up a, a residency at the Mercer Art Center. And every Tuesday, they'll appear there. So I was working for Melody Maker, and Roy Hollingsworth, who was the journalist, said, let's go photograph the dolls. And it caught on in England. It really caught on. In England, they immediately, they looked at him, and they loved him. Record companies steered clear. They didn't want to know. So Steve Lieber and I concluded that we should take them to Europe. And he got them to be the opening act for Rod Stewart at Wembley. It was amazing the buzz that they generated over there uh, and the sense that they were on the verge of taking that next step into getting a record contract, into becoming one of the first new and successful bands of the 1970s. You know, Johnny is, at that point, a happy-go-lucky fucking kid, and everything's coming true. Then Billy dies from misadventure. Billy had gone out alone that night. He'd met a girl. She'd asked him to go to a party. So he goes to the party. Um, I don't know if it's a mixture of downers, and alcohol, he seems to have passed out. And they put him in a bathtub and tried to pour hot coffee down his throat and he choked on his own regurgitation and, and died. Billy would ingest whatever was available in any amount that he could throw down his throat. It was a tragedy not spoken about thereafter, ever. When, well, what happened first of all, our drummer died in England. And um, when we were together, we were, you know, nobody could, nobody could mess with us. And then with that one person gone and everything, it's like... We got this phone call. Yes, we're going to continue, and we're going to dedicate this phase of our journey to Billy Mercia. We had this open jam session to find a new drummer. We tried like 10, 20 people, I don't know how many, about that. When Billy Mercy died, that seemed like the end. And then redemption came in the form of Jerry Nolan, one of the best rock and roll drummers that rock and roll has ever been graced with. Fantastic. And he and Johnny, Jerry Nolan and Johnny Thunders became kind of soulmates. Well, everybody knew each other kind of, you know? I mean, individually, before we met each other, we all sort of had the same ideas in mind, you know. Mm. You know, rock and roll had become this just bedenimed kind of 
drum solo kind of thing. And what we wanted to do is bring it down to three minutes and put that little Richard drag on top of it. And and that's what rock and roll was to us. You know, we were just trying to make rock and roll, you know. Punk rock wasn't even a thought at that time, I don't think, but the the seeds for punk were certainly being sown by the Dolls and by all the bands that had come uh, previous to that, such as the Velvets and Stooges and the MC5. And you're a In England, there was this thing, this controversy, because this guy said, what do you say, mock rock? Which, you know, I mean, I, I could have cared less at the time, but I can see how it kind of like galvanized kids who thought like, well, this is the real deal, so what do you know, you all fart? First of all, music from an American group, who are to the Stones, what the monkeys were to the Beatles, a pale and amusing derivative. These are the New York Dolls. <laughs> I saw them and they're kind of a uh, the way that they didn't care about nothing and uh, that just really struck me straight away you know what I mean it was like something completely different to anything else that was going on there every punk band that I knew in London and I knew all of them they they all had both of the New York Dollars albums no one had told us we had all this impact you know? <laughs> we didn't know anything about it yeah we would have moved to England and stayed here when I say I'm in love you best believe I'm in love L-U-V I know there's this thing, oh, Malcolm McLaren managed the dolls, but you know, he hung around with us for like the last two weeks of our existence. We were like, we were going down in flames. Malcolm thought like, what's the most shocking thing in America? They're really afraid of communism in America. So let's make all these red clothes and have a red party. Then for shock value, you put a big flag with a hammer and sickle in the back. Uh, they didn't sing about being communists. It was just there to irritate people and it sure did. It's so funny to think now that, you know, that communism in the States was like, was like child molesting, you know. So this was it. I mean, you know, in America, which we were such a hard pill to swallow. You know, everyone was booing them, you know, faggots, get off the stage and, well, you know, a lot of that stuff. We were number one, man, and we were way ahead of the pack, and that's when we fell and broke our leg, and bam, everybody else just The red ran and over the us. show, and that, that look was the, kind of the, the final blow. So they weren't really making much money. They weren't selling a lot of records. There was a lot of drinking going on. Arthur drank more than anybody I've ever seen in my life. Uh, after Johnny and then Jerry discovered uh, heroin, there was a lot of that, and that takes a lot of time. They were unreliable because, in fact, of Johnny. You know, he was the, the main source of getting stoned. In fact, he then eventually turned Jerry on to it. And when I learned that Jerry also was taking drugs, I said, you ass, you know, you fool. Then Malcolm McLaren came along and dressed him in red clothes. He was surprised when he got here to find out that the band was basically breaking up, that the management had dropped them, they had no management, they had no shows booked, they had nothing actually. It was the early winter, like January or so of 75, and, um, and the band was basically over. And so I sat there and I thought, I'm just going to turn them into Chinese Red Guards. <laughs> I just think this is all this trash glam and old Dolls Hospital. I saw that it's just over. You can't do that anymore. It's an old image. It's gone. You, it didn't happen first time. Forget it. It was David who said, well, why don't we put up the red flag? And, he, and Malcolm said, oh, my God, because Malcolm is a little bit of a commie bastard. So we did this whole build up to this red patent leather thing, which was meant to be a goof. And Arthur was supposed to play. He had the costume, he had everything. The day before he was supposed to play, he went in rehab again. We had a conversation with David. 
at the loft, and it was it was basically like like David, can you cool down your ego? Because his ego was just like overboard. It was just as bad as being on heroin, if you can. And he was drinking way way too much. And and since '73, every day, you know, like wake up in the morning and pew, bam. And then a week later, Jerry had to go into fucking rehab, and we used this black drummer, this guy from this Spider from a band called Pure Hell. They were wearing this red leather, and behind them they had a, a huge hammer and sickle. And you know, this is before Glasnost. So it was very, very, very strange. It was all fabulous, and they really looked new. They looked like, oh, this is new, this is fresh. This is a new, a new New York doll. Nobody really got it, and they just saw it like, and yes, it was the end of the war. And it was a bad moment, and we were fucking schmucks. And, you know, things are getting kind of bad, so everything went down the tubes. Then they fire me. And they're going to go take Arthur out of rehab and go down to Florida and start a tour with no roadie and Malcolm driving him. Uh, they get there 24 hours, and Johnny calls me again. He said, come down, Arthur can't play. We're down there for two weeks. We play this fucking club, and we're doing pretty well. But it all worked until we all break up, of course, in Florida, staying at Jerry Nolan's mother's house. The hurricane connection that Johnny and Jerry developed got busted. So they're dying to go home. Arguments uh, ideologically spewed forth, particularly from David Johansson, who says, I've had enough of this. As we were sitting down and eating one night, and yeah, Jerry Nolan, and Johnny Thunders, they got monkeys on their back, just like Malcolm McLaren used to describe it. And they're itching. But they're trying to make it work. They're there to make it work. He got really, really nasty with us, you know. And this was not the first time, but this was like the last time. He just basically said, at the end of the, the, the whole conversation, that we were all replaceable. I think uh, Johnny who was persuaded by Jerry, ah, oh, we don't want to be with, we want to be with the dolls like the old dolls, this is too fucking crazy, McLaren's completely mad and blah blah blah, and of course all they wanted to do was get back to New York and score. When I was driving him to the airport with Johnny, with Malcolm McLaren, and we had the Fury 3 and they're getting out, and they're walking towards, you know, the entrance of the airport, it really like, you know, I don't know why, but it hit me to, to to yell out loud, hey, you guys, like, what about the New York Dolls? And the only guy, Johnny kept on walking, and but, but Jerry turned around like this, he said, fuck the New York Dolls.